Hello, everybody. It is our weekly Locked On Big 12 Conference crossover. I am Josh Neighbors. To my right is Stephen Simcox of Locked On Horn Frogs. To his right, it is Linda Godfrey of Locked On Pokes. Below her, it is Jacob Hatch of Locked On Cougars. And then to the left of him, below me and Stephen, it is John Williams of Locked On Sooners. That is the best intro I've ever done in terms of directions and getting people's names correct. We're off to a hot start. We've got a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, It is proposed, it is talked about right now, that there will be divisions, not just in the new Big 12 down the line, but in the immediate future when we add four new teams and keep the uh, Texas and Oklahomas of the world that are off the SEC, we're going to have divisions. What will that look like? What, What should it look like? Who wants what? All that coming up on today's show. Also, Gary Patterson wearing a Texas Longhorns pullover. That's coming up too. You are Locked On Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, once again, I am Josh Neighbors of Locked On Big 12. That is Stephen Simcox of Locked On Horn Frogs. That is Linda Godfrey of Locked On Pokes. That is Jake Hatch of Locked On Cougars. That is also John Williams of Locked On Sooners. We are here today to talk about not just the Big 12 Conference, but the the future of of the Big 12 Conference and what it might look like. So CBS Sports had an article today. Uh, I believe Dennis Dodd was the author of said article that the Big 12 Conference right now is exploring um, the divisions. And so how they're going to split things up. I believe the rule, you guys can correct me if I was wrong, the NCAA mandates that teams, uh, conference, excuse me, above 12 teams must have divisions. Well, the Big 12 Conference is facing a situation where they're going to at least have 12 teams in the long-term future, but they're probably going to have 14 for at least two to three years because it seems like at this point in time that Oklahoma and Texas are not going to go to the Southeastern Conference until the grant of rights contract ends for the Big 12 Conference with Fox slash ESPN. So uh, I'll go to you first, Stephen. When you heard this news today, I mean, you know, it, there's a lot of work to be done, right? I mean, there is a multiple division of conference that's going to happen here. Do you divide the conference up? Uh, and you split OU in Texas and then subtract them and keep things the same? Do you just do different? What do you do here um, as you break things up? And also just your general reactions to hearing this news. Yeah, a lot of moving parts. I mean, the OU in Texas angle is interesting. Um, I didn't really factor in the idea of, like, we need to keep them separated. One, because you don't potentially want those, uh, you know, two teams messing things up in the future when you eventually have them move out of the conference. But uh, geographically, it'll be kind of weird because obviously they're so close together and that's such a great rivalry for the conference itself. I think overall it's good. Um, You know, the round-robin format was unique, and I feel like it gave the Big 12 an advantage from like a branding standpoint. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that coin is I think it made the schedule tougher. Like, I mean, when you're in divisions and you avoid certain teams every year, that's helpful. You know, you look at the SEC and it's changed now, but for years, like the SEC East was a pretty manageable division once you got past, um, you know, maybe the top one or two teams. And if you can avoid Alabama or you can avoid LSU, you know, that's a significant thing. Obviously, the ACC's done it and Clemson has kind of owned their side of the division until recently. Um, but I feel like for teams that are sort of trying to make a move and get out of the middle of the pack, this will be a really good thing. Um, because you don't have to necessarily go see every single team in the league, and maybe you will have one division that ends up being a little more manageable than the other. Like, I don't need to go uh, watch TCU play uh, while toothless mountain people yell at them in Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, (laughs) That's just – that's an unnecessary road trip that doesn't necessarily need to be taken every other year. So, um, from a competitive standpoint, I think it's good. I feel like it's going to help. Like, for a league that's going to lose – some natural rivalries and probably their biggest one with OU and Texas. I think also it's going to help develop some bad blood between schools that are in the same division. Um, So a lot of positives to it. And, you know, it seems like they are being forward thinking, which is something I would not accuse the big 12 of being 
in the past. So it's good that they are on top of this and that it's already started to leak out because it's, you know, good discussion and good fodder for the off season. So John, I, I want to go to you next because when I, when I saw this news, I thought immediately that UCF could host Oklahoma in not just a conference game, but a division game. The team that went, you know, 13 and 0 and won a fictional national championship and has just been banging the drum for, you know, just kind of, they were, I mean, great for Cincinnati, but like UCF was Cincinnati before, you know, Cincinnati was Cincinnati. Yeah. So that team could host a perennial power in Oklahoma at the, what I call the bounce house, the bounce castle, whatever ridiculous name they have, the launch pad. I forgot what the name is they have for, but that's a realistic scenario. And, and it just makes me smile. Like that's, when you know when I told you guys about my twelve team playoff idea, where I had seven automatic bids, like that was the idea, right? That the idea is a team like OU travels to a place like UCF and plays a team like that, and that could be a divisional football game in like two years. I mean, how awesome is that? Yeah, I think it's a lot of fun. I, you know, I, I talked about it in the group chat that. You know, even if Oklahoma and Texas only get to be a part of a 14 team Big 12, I think it, it is going to be fun. Uh, I, I've felt for a long time that they should have expanded when they had realignment, you know, 10 years ago, but they didn't. And now Oklahoma and Texas aren't going to get the benefit of the, of the future realignment because I think it'd also be great to go up to Cincinnati and play in that, you know, that hotbed of, of football that's been so historically mm -hmm. prominent for what, 100 years now. And I thought that would have been great too, just down the road from the College Football Hall of Fame, you know, Pop Warner's home state, like all these great things that could have happened um, with Oklahoma going to Cincinnati, going up to Utah. I mean, I think Sooners fans would have loved to make that trip. I mean, I know I, I want to go to Utah, but uh, just so many awesome opportunities for just new rivalries in the Big 12. I love the idea that they're, like you said, they're being forward thinking. And trying to figure out a bet, the best way to integrate the new teams with the outgoing teams, at least for a couple of years, and and try to have a smooth transition, as smooth as possible. I mean, there's always going to be you know that um, that transition period that takes place, but you know if you think ahead of time, you can make it a little bit smoother. I like you know going to Orlando for a, a I was going to say game. Oklahoma. That's fans kind of fun. Be, like yeah, Oklahoma fans will be glad to make that trip. Yeah, you can go to Disney, you hit Disney up, it may be hit up Universal Studios. I love Orlando, except for like the heat. Hopefully you don't have to go there in right. September. But um, yeah, cool place. I think there's just a lot of really neat things that could happen with, with this kind of um, initial expansion before the realignment happens. I am thinking if, if Texas had played a game this year in Orlando, it would have been like, I mean, they drowned in a few fourth quarters this year. They would have like drowned, drowned. That that would like you would have seen. I mean, their entire defensive line cramping at one time. I feel like if they played that game, um, Jake, I'll go to you next on this. So, the idea of do you, you want to make these divisions probably concrete? As in, like once Oklahoma and Texas leave, you don't want them to change, especially if you're a BYU fan, right? Because once you, I mean, you're glad to be there, but you kind of want to build a bit of consistency once you get there, right? Well, and the way that Dennis Dodd kind of laid out, he had a North and South division, the way he kind of laid things out. And I've, I've always been a thought that going to West Virginia and UCF are going to be very extensive travel things for BYU, mm. just going clear across the country. So if you put them in that proposed South division where you might go there once every two or three years versus maybe every year or every other year, it's probably better for all parties' interest, in my opinion. I'm all about, if you have that North Division, including Cincinnati, the Kansas schools, Oklahoma, and Iowa State, I'm all for that. That's relatively decent travel for BYU. It kind of keeps a north-south dividing line between these two, and I think it actually keeps the divisions relatively balanced, all things considered. Yeah, the one catch with that one is, what's the split with, you know, because there's five, so the, the big hold up here is there's going to yeah. be five Texas schools. Yep, and that's, that's right. the thing. You make, you make that South Division very Texas-centric, and that is going to exactly. cause some, people some consternation. Uh, Linda, would you would you be somebody who wants um, – in my opinion, I, I think the rivalries should be – you try to keep them in division as much as possible so we don't end up with the potential that we had this year for Bedlam the last week of the season and then Bedlam once again. How, what's your thought on that? Would you want to keep rivalries – 
in the same division or would you be fine with spreading them out and, you know, having that potential for Bedlam one and two back to back? I'm, I would be okay with having Bedlam back to back. What I don't want is Texas and OU in opposite divisions. And then those two schools go to the big 12 championship for the next several years before they leave. That does nothing for the big 12 as a whole. So I think, and I get the concrete and like wanting to start a routine with the divisions and how putting them each in their own and then just pulling them. Uh, like I, I understand that, but I just don't think it would benefit the big 12 to put them on opposite sides of the spectrum. And then they meet every year in the big 12 championship before they leave. Now at the beginning of the season, I didn't think that OU and Texas were going to be in the big 12 to the end of this contract. I thought that they were both going to get out as quick as they could, but with uh, as abysmal as Texas played and OU's uh, coaching uh, fiasco, uh, that's clearly not, not what they happen. prefer transition, Linda. That's the, that's the term. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Fans prefer. I wouldn't want to, sp- you know, make any uh, sooner fans mad. So. <laughs> hey, Brevin was ain't scared. He had, no, he, no, he is not. He is not scared. But but here's what I would say. I think all things considered, this is the best. This is the best thing for them because we saw it last year. Arkansas is a decent team. Texas got throttled by them, and Oklahoma. While we all, I think we we all kind of came to consensus, they're going to be good long term. Brent needs some time to v- build and. I've thought about it like Oklahoma should be the favorite next year in the Big 12 Conference just because of, you know, what the hell are we doing with everybody else? Like this is this it's gonna be a step back for a lot of teams next year. Uh, a lot of transition hit coming for next year, but I, I think it's good for both parties involved. I want to show a couple proposals here for how we break this thing up. So here is one that I have, and we're gonna use. Um, uh, so this is Big 12 divisions BS before split because the, the split is BS, and I also feel like it's a great term to use. Just so BS, and then we'll call AS after split. I don't have any a- AS graphics, but this is just before split. So BYU, Kansas, Iowa State, Cincinnati, West Virginia, UCF. Now to Jake's point, travel there is a bit difficult for BYU, um, but this is kind of like the north. This was about as north as you could split it. Now you had to include one southern team, kind of, but because of the number of Texas teams, and I didn't want to pry a rivalry apart, right? You want to keep all Texas and all, all those people together. So then you, you shift now to the south: Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, TCU, Texas, Baylor, Texas, uh, Texas Tech, Baylor, Texas, Houston. You put all those teams together. So basically. It is Texas, and it is uh, it's Oklahoma. Those, those two school, those two uh, states are just are just tied together right there. Uh, also, we had a model, th- and this one is from uh, Shahan Jaraja. He put this one out. So North would be Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, West Virginia, Cincinnati. Your South, Texas, Houston, Baylor, TCU, Texas Tech, UCF, and BYU. The big differentiation there is, uh, excuse me, I'm going to pull this back up, is that you would, as opposed to just attaching another state, Oklahoma, to the Texas teams, you split it halfway and you go BYU to one side, UCF to the other. Now, that still is a long trip for BYU, Jake, but it's a bunch of shorter trips in the interim with the Texas schools. So I think that kind of works out a bit better. Well, I actually think BYU actually would be okay with UCF being part of it just because I think that they have – designs of actually opening up some recruiting ground in Mm. the Midwest. And you can get out into Florida. We all know that there's athletes out there. I know it's a long trip to get a guy from Florida to go to Utah, but the university of Utah has proven they can do it. Some of their best players in recent memory from the university of Utah are Florida natives. So I think BYU, if they could work it and they're okay with the travel, I think they'd be all for it. Uh, Steven, do you think the sneaky part of all this is, is kind of what to Jake said, does does everybody want to play? UCF because of where they're located and to, to kind of make this clear, like what this looks like is, Hey, you're, you're trying to recruit a kid from Florida. Uh, hey, we're playing where you are, right? It's, it's just, it's just great that you, you know, we're somewhere near where you live. We're coming to you. And also while we're, while you're in college, we're probably going to come near you as well. We'll probably play near you too. So, Stephen, what do you think about the idea of you know? Do you think that's something there that everybody kind of wants to play UCF as much as they can? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, there's something to that. You know, Florida is a talent-rich state, and if you can get in front of some of those kids with the proposal or with the pitch of, hey, we'll be there every other year, you know, and your family can come out. Um, it's going to be good for, for you and your friends. You can play. You can. Uh, it's not a long trip to get to that game. Um, that's what people always talk about with Texas, too. You know, everybody's trying to get in the state. Everybody's trying to recruit. Mm. So I, I definitely see that being, you know, part of it. Um, but I think both of these work. It, it is tricky though with with what you do with Oklahoma and Oklahoma State because I like, I really like how you set things up, Josh. But you do have the factor of, you know, just the South teams would love it. I mean, you're just traveling between OU and Texas, right? That would be, you know, that would be huge for the uh, schools in the state of Texas as far as recruiting and you know hitting up the high schools there and saying, hey, you don't, your furthest road trip during the regular season is going to be to Stillwater or Norman. Um, but you also have BYU, you know, Cincinnati, some of those schools having to make these, these long distances. So it doesn't, you know, geographically, it's not as clean as the old big 12 or it was pretty clear where the North and South lines are drawn. So, um, somebody's going to get the short end of the stick and it, it's funny because it being a Texas centric conference again, um, if those are the schools in power, then that was what caused a lot of the problems, you know, with right. with the implosion of the Big 12, the first go around. But, um, yeah, to answer your original question, I do feel like from whether it's coming to Orlando and kind of it being a fun trip for the fan base, a fun trip for the guys on the team, and then also you combine that with the ability to recruit and just allow some of those local kids to see some different programs, that's going to be a big selling point um, when it comes to playing in the new look Big 12. Uh, Orlando is going to become Big 12 fans Nashville, right? When, when teams play Vanderbilt in the SEC, it's like, oh boy. Now, to UCF's credit, like I'm not saying you're Vanderbilt and your stadium is much more full and your your tickets will be much more expensive to get in the building. But like, you know, Kansas State fans, you know, we live, you know, we live in Manhattan, Kansas. Guess what's awesome in the middle of November? Uh, a, a good old trip down to Orlando, Florida. That That's what's great. I, I wish we had a West Virginia person because – their case is very interesting. They've Cincinnati is going to be their counterpart, right? That is somebody they a hundred percent must be paired with for the geographic rivalry. I will say this 2007 is a beloved cherished year for college football fans. That is one of West Virginia's best years during their best years. West Virginia had a whole lot of Florida kids. That is what West Virginia, and I know I know it talked about everybody else generally, but that is one school I think that needs to be paired with UCF. Geographically, it's going to make sense for them just because of the eastern proximity. I know it's a far trip, trip south for them, but that is something that they're definitely 110% going to want is being paired up with UCF. So that that's something I'm 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 going to see happening here. Linda, I want to ask you, you you hit on this this Texas Oklahoma thing. The Big 12 has to put those two together, right? There is no situation in which the powers that be say, sure, we'll let you guys go in different conference, uh, different divisions, let you guys still have your game and give you guys the potential to uh, you know, play in a Big 12 title game. Now, it feels like Texas might be far away from that, but hey, you never know. They have to be in the same division, right? I think they do. I, I just don't see any benefit long-term for the Big 12. That being, I mean, we're giving them credit for like trying to plan ahead. <laughs> How far ahead are they planning is probably the next question on the docket. But I, I'm, I, I think you have to keep them in the same division in order to keep some blood alive in the other schools in the Big 12. And I know, like you said, Texas didn't play, hasn't been, you know, they're back every season. But anything can happen any given Saturday, Sunday, whatever day you play football. And the last thing the Big 12 needs right now is for those two teams that have like ran the division. And yes, I did air quotes. We'll fight about it off air that like <laughs> we don't want them to go out on top. Like that's the last thing right. the Big 12 needs. Uh, so, I was, so I was wondering, ahead, like, is, ahead, there, is there a situation where they could do like an east west? Now, I know there's not like a perfect dividing line on that, but there's not really for north south either. And, you know, this is just kind of like off the top of my head thinking like if you have BYU and Tech. Should we – so, so, Do Kansas we have a name we could Kansas use State that's not Oklahoma, East, West, like, North, South, John? Like, like have you thought of one maybe? Because like – but also it doesn't matter. I mean the yeah. Cowboys are in the NFC East. Yeah. It, the Chiefs are in the AFC West. You know, it's 
it's all a little bit relative. All the terms are loose. It's yeah. semantics. There's, it's, it's just like, semantics. You know, the Falcons play in the NFC West at one point in time. Yeah, yes, like, no, you know, I will I'm a, say, I'm a Niners fan, and I do remember those Falcons <laughs> NFC West battles. So, so the problem is, you know, because I remember the Big Ten got ridiculed. Leaders and Legends was. I was gonna say Leaders and Legends is available. Let's just go with that one. I was just let's just double down on that one because they ended up having to change that, right? Yeah. So that is, but here's the thing: like, look. Missouri plays in the SEC and my, my alma mater plays in the SEC East. They play South Carolina. The only thing those two schools have in common, they both are in a place called Columbia, nothing else in common. So is the title just semantics? Do you think John, or can we find some creative ways? We're like this, the, the fun six and the more fun six. I don't know. Yeah. You, I mean, you could have the original, the original six and yeah. You know, I mean, of course there's not, there's more than original six, but right. Actually, no, actually, no, there's the original uh, it, six, and then you have West Virginia and um, TCU. And TCU. TCU. Yeah, and then you have the, the next four, and that's your new six. Like, I mean, we call them the hockey fans four. would love that. You Can know, we the, divide by mascot? Do we have like, <laughs> like, like human mascot and animals? Together. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's all semantics a little bit, but I think like having Utah and Texas Tech play regularly, I think that'd be kind of cool because I mean BYU, you mean? BYU. Or, yeah, BYU. Sorry, Jake. Um yeah, BYU and Texas Tech play regularly, BYU Iowa State play regularly. There's something cool to having those, you know, somewhat geographical rivalries. Yeah. And and I think, you know, having Cincinnati, West Virginia, West Virginia, UCF playing on a regular basis makes sense. Baylor, Houston playing on a regular basis makes a lot of sense. Trying to keep them as, as geographical as possible because it just makes it easier for fans to take road trips. Not everybody's going to try to fly. People right. are going to want to drive to games. And if you just have just a few hours to go or you can you know drive late on a Friday night to get there on, you know, and then get up early for that big noon kickoff on at 11 o'clock, uh, then you're being, you'll be in good shape. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I like the idea of geographics playing a, a part in it. I know it's not going to be perfect because just the way it's spread out. I mean, it's, it's like conference USA all of a sudden. Um, but yeah, keeping as much of that alive as possible. I, I mean, UCF and Houston, I mean, they're f- five States away, but right. two major hubs, Houston and UCF can get to each other pretty easily. Um, it's not, and that big of a deal of traveling between those two. Well, they've already done, they've already done it before too, right? Right. In, in exactly. In conference, uh, I I would say I I, I heard you say CUSA, and I'm sure Bob Bowlesby cringed. If he, he would cringe if he heard you be like, "Oh no, sorry, comparing Bob. us to CUSA, not great." <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think the interesting part is is there any chance anybody in Texas could split at all? And and and. Go ahead, go ahead, John. If you have any thought on this, no, I was gonna, I don't know, but I think it'd be a good idea because then it gives more Big Twelve schools like regular games in Texas, as opposed right. to just keeping it all in state. And I think that's going to be something that comes, which up is with, fair. And I think that's fair to have more guy, more teams play in Texas. Yeah, and I think it'll be something that comes up in those president meetings and AD meetings amongst the Big Twelve schools that are remaining. Like they will, like all those schools will want to play regularly in Texas every single year at least. Um, and I mean, they will with the scheduling, the way it all works out. If it's a non-division divisional opponent, you'll still probably have at least one or two games in Texas because there's so many schools, but I mean, you know, creating some kind of, um, rivalry that, that hypes that game up a little bit makes a little bit of sense. And I think it'd be cool for them to create some kind of a uh, neutral site game, um, whether it's, you know, TCU and, and Texas Tech or Houston and Texas Tech or Baylor and Texas Tech, something like that, like where they play in Dallas, Fort Worth. It's not going to be, you know, the Cotton Bowl Red River, but it can still be something that gets, ex, you know, gets a lot of hype and gets people excited. So, yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead Stephen. Yeah. Cause you're, you're the resident Texan here. Well, I was just going to say, I think you could send Houston with like Cincinnati yeah. and UCF and BYU. And it would make sense. I'm just not sure Holgo is going to go for it. And he's not the type of dude that would be like super chill about it. If they, you know, <laughs> if he felt like they screwed him over. Neither would uh, Mr. Fertitta either, who is the, one of the no. power holders that we know. Cause here's the thing, Steven, they want their shot at the Texas schools. That's really what they want here. Yes. They want and, to say we're the, we're one of the big boys here in the state. Well, and nobody in the state will say it, but I mean, a big reason they, they finally relented because they were desperate. But a big reason as to why they didn't want to let them in is because, like, that is 
a urban talent rich area like Houston the fourth is where, largest city in America. Yeah, everybody goes to Houston to get athletes, and you know, like Tom Herman kind of dabbled with it a little bit. He got Ed Oliver to stick around and stay home, um, and you see, you'd see the occasional guy from that area that would stick around. But for the most part, you know, those guys would go to LSU or they'd stay in the state and go elsewhere to a power five school. Um, so it's a big draw. And I mean, obviously like Holgerson knows how to coach, like there's potential there at Houston. Um, you've seen it with basketball and how they've turned it around there as well. So that's, uh, it, you know, it's a dangerous, I think sleeping giant is like an overused term. I feel like anytime they there's are. a job open <laughs> in college athletics, we're like, Oh, this school's a sleeping giant, but Houston does have some potential, um, to really capitalize on their location. Yeah. Because Ba- so basketball has done it in a different, different way. I mean, Kelvin Sampson's done a really good job there. Say what you want about him. He's done a really good job there. Um, football, you're right. And like this, it, especially with Texas staying in the conference, OU doesn't really matter as much to them. But if they can get a win against Texas in the next couple of years, you know, and, and things maybe don't go well for Texas, and they get a win against them. And I mean, they're going to be trying to make as many statements as possible over the course of the next couple of years. Cause you're right. That is somewhere that gets pillaged, not just by teams in the big 12 but sec teams, LSU being the one that's got the most proximity and, and obviously others nearby can come in there and get guys sleeping giants, the right term, just because of how, how big of a market is. And they got it's a big donor base too. A huge donor base. And also, I mean, think about the, once again, the guy who calls the shots, last name is Fertitta. And we all, we are very familiar with the, everybody's very familiar with, with that last name. They, they run a whole bunch of shit in this country. So, uh, you know, and, and look, Dana, Dana just had a season where I didn't think that team was particularly great. Um, they won 12 games. So, you know, it gets you thinking like, what, what could they rattle off? Anyway, the big point here is this is a fascinating conversation from so many angles. I mean, we just filled 27 minutes, no breaks, which our boss, David Locke, wouldn't love. So I'll get to that in a second. But 27 minutes about all the different possibilities, and we barely scratched the surface. We haven't even talked about what it looks like when OU in Texas leaves. So let's touch on that here in one second. Also, we'll touch on GP, Gary Patterson, wearing a Texas Longhorns hoodie uh, uh, pullover. But first, quick word from our sponsors here. Today's show is brought to you by Bill Bar. You guys can go to built.com today. It's built.com. Check out the collection of built bars. It is New Year's. And so if you all are making New Year's resolutions, built bar is a great place to go. Replace that candy bar, the delicious built bar. John's got it. I was going to say, John, do you have it? John has it. Fire, what, what flavor? Peanut butter brownie? Is that what it is? That's the caramel macchiato. This time. Oh, my goodness. How is it good? I haven't it's had it. It's fantastic. Good. Yeah, I and, love it. Uh, you guys replace, you know, the Snickers bar with the caramel macchiato. You can have it after workout. You can have it before workout. You don't have to feel guilty about it at all. Plenty of new flavors, always releasing more flavors all the time. Go check it out. Built.com today. It's built.com promo code locked 15. All right. So John, I'm going to, I'm going to exclude you here for one quick second. Just very fast. Um, Steven, when you, when they, when Oklahoma and Texas leave, do you want to see the change? Uh, and, and the conferences, uh, the divisions, excuse me, mix up at all? Or do you just want to have divisions that, hey, look, we'll suffer OU and Texas being on opposite sides, you know, we'll grit our teeth and bear it, so we don't have to shuffle once they leave? Yeah, I'm okay with suffering through OU and Texas being on different sides. I mean, I, I understand, like, the potential of, yeah, the championship game, the jokes will be made, it would be a bad look in some ways for the conference. But, you know, Texas would actually actually get to the game, which is something they haven't done, um, you know, a lot consistently recently. So I don't really trust them to do that. And I, I think establishing an identity, establishing like these are the divisions, these are the games you're going to see year in and year out, makes more sense for when those schools leave. So I don't – and to me that's not a huge hindrance, like having them on either side of the bracket. Now if Sark gets it rolling and all of a sudden um, they go to two or three straight Big 12 title games and – yeah, you got some egg on your face, but I just I think it's going to be okay. I feel like the trade off of you know getting um, some natural rivalries going will be good for the conference. Jay, do you think there's a scenario where they could do the thing where they prevent OU and Texas from making the title game? So so put them together in a division, and then once they both leave, 
slide one over, slide, you know, kind of just a little uh, Tetris, if you will, to, to make some sliding happen to where, look, not too many teams are affected, but a couple are. I think they could. If they're going to do something like that, they've got to make that known when they do this 14 right. team deal. You say, hey, we're going to 14. This is what's going to be until Texas and Oklahoma leave. Once that happens, X, Y, and Z is going to happen after that. I'm I'm a proponent of putting them in opposite divisions just that way when they slide out, they slide out, and then you just continue on with what you got. But I could understand them deciding, you know what, we're going to prevent one or the other from making it, so we'll put them both in the same division. Linda, are you team Tetris or are you, you, you team uh, F them, put them in the same division? Um, I, yeah, I'm all for, I'm just, we'll just move around afterwards. Listen, I know I'm petty. I know it's going to be complicated, but I have, as an Oklahoma State fan, had mud on my face more times than I care to admit. I'm over it. I just want to get out and stop with the OU and Texas ruling the Big 12 thing. And I know that Texas hasn't been playing well. I get it. But the the fear is enough to have me on edge. And got yeah, the thank you. Twin yours, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> Our guy, Stephen Stevens, <laughs> Stevens, favorite player, number one fan, That's right, baby. I'll defend and, him to the death. While you guys were slandering eighteen year old boy on this podcast, I was stepping in because I like to protect the kids. Not uh, guilty. About. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, also, I think appreciate Linda correcting me because yeah, I team Tetris and also team same division the same thing. But yes, they correct me. Uh, all right, one more quick word from our sponsors now, and then we'll get to we're gonna clear out. Everybody's gonna isolate and let Stephen take the ball. Uh, and I have an image to show that goes along with it. First, though, a quick word from our sponsors, our good friends at Netsuite by Oracle. Netsuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth for your small business. With visibility and control of your financials, inventory, and HR, planning, budgeting, and more, NetSuite is everything you need to grow all in one place. With NetSuite, you can guarantee your processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. Over 28,000 businesses already use NetSuite. The new year, NetSuite has a new financing program for those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash locked. That is netsuite.com slash locked. Locked for this special one-of-a-kind financing offer on the number one financial system for growing businesses. That is netsuite.com slash locked. All right, Stephen. So the way it's been described to uh, a lot of us is that it is a done deal. And the thing that is a done deal, it's just a matter of time. This right here is a done deal. For those of you who don't know, that is one Gary Patterson, former uh, Texas Christian University football coach with one Chris Del Conte, University of Texas athletic director. You'll notice Mr. Patterson, who is prominently featured here, is wearing a Texas Longhorns pullover during tonight's Texas Kansas State basketball game. Steven, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, let me say as we're recording this, Kansas State took down Texas 66 to 65. Wait, they did? Yeah. I had, I had no clue that happened. Yeah, Marquise Newell with the layup. So Gary Patterson had a game where his team lost a winnable game. Shocker there. Uh, secondly, <laughs> he got let go. It is his right to do what he wants, and it is my right to be angry about it. So <laughs> if, like, if you want to go down there and get a nice check and be an analyst and work 20 hours a week and play your bad country music on – you know, Sixth Street for all the local people in Austin. That's fine, sir. You go ahead and do it. Um, I will say that I have been a defender in the past. You know, we, we've sort of been a punchline here at TCU for erecting a statue of a man that is still very much alive and kicking. And I really thought that that wouldn't be much of a problem even after he was fired. But now it kind of looks like we just have a shrine to our ex. So that's not great. <laughs> and I think maybe we should put a tarp over that for the time being. And just unveil it a little later. But, I'm, uh, you know, I'm very happy for him. Um, he's reunited with Chris Del Conte. And if they want to underperform and not live up to expectations there, and that's good. You know, get your money, man. Do your thing. You did a lot for the university. But, uh, yeah, I hope that Sonny Dykes puts 55 points on you. Did like he did when he was at SMU. Did and you, he did that at TCU. Did you just advocate for re-unveiling a statue that's already been unveiled? 
Yeah. I say what we do is we cover it up and we pretend like it's not there. And then, you know, when time passes and things are a little bit cooler, um, we just unveil it. And it's sort of like, you know, talking to your kids about an old flame that you had. It's like this was a different time in life. And it was, you know, it was a good time. And then we went through a rough patch, but now we're back. In all honesty, like he did, he did amazing things. Um, and he can do what he wants, but like this is and this is who he is. Like, this is who he is to a T. This is what's always motivated him. He has always been the petty person that has a grudge and wants to rub it in your face. Yes, but I had to sit through all those press conferences where he was accusing people of hitting Jerry Kill in the head with a helmet and SMU, like, running amok and putting their flag on the field and all those conspiracy theories. And I sat through all that, and now, you know, I'm going to have to watch him in the press box. And, you know, these media folks are just going to fawn over him. Every time, like any time Texas has a good game defensively, we're going to get all these shots in Gary in the press. Oh, Gary's a genius. Look at what Gary did for Steve Sarkeesian. Gary's got, he brought a new attitude to the 40 acres. They have a chip on their shoulder now because Gary's there and he taught him about how to be a two-star recruit and develop talent. It's like, grow up. If that's why they're good, that's not why they're going to be good. Have you seen the recruiting class? They should be good. Um, They should be good. John, I'm going to ask you here. Steven, thank you for that, by the way. (laughs) <laughs> John, if you're Pete Kwiatkowski, Texas defensive coordinator, for those of you who don't know, and the way it's been described is he's taken the Jerry Kill role, um, you know, kind of off the side. Jerry Kill became the interim head coach. So if you're Pete Kwiatkowski, how much of the, oh, he's just an analyst, don't worry, are you thinking about? After your defense sucked. And I think Pete Kukowski is a very good defensive coordinator. They're paying him a lot of money. Uh, how much How much of that are you worried about? Oh, you're definitely looking over your shoulder. Like It's it's just a few bad games with bad performances by your defense before Gary Patterson takes over. And, not, and that's not even going to say that Gary Patterson fixes the defense because a lot of it's mentality. I mean, we heard the coach in the locker room uh, or on the bus – after a game this season, just talking about the guys and the mentality that they didn't have uh, mm-hmm. to play defense. And, you know, everybody's kind of, you know, snickering at him almost. And um, that's, that's a lot of it. You know, like when Matt Campbell talked about, you know, having three stars with a five star mentality, I mean, that does make a difference. You know, Texas has generally pretty much every single year had pretty good recruiting classes, but it's not translated to the field. Is that similar to what's going on with my Dallas Cowboys where you do have talented players but it's not translating to the field because that's what because that seems to be what has been going on at texas for the last you know decade and a half they have good recruiting classes they they look great on paper they're going to be everybody's darling especially on the big networks but then it doesn't end up showing itself on the field and i think i mean steven's absolutely right like if lincoln riley is any evidence of what the major media does uh with a with a coach at a major program in a major media market Gary Patterson will be fawned over by ESPN. ESPN already loves Texas. This is just going to be one of those things. Like they're going to be ecstatic to put his country music on a college game day one Saturday morning, even it's if awful. he's just an analyst. So, bad too. so I mean, it's <laughs> I yes, he needs to be looking over his shoulder. Gary Patterson will be the defensive coordinator, I believe. By I'm going to bold prediction here by week nine. I I just want to I just want to point out that during during the show, um. Uh, Steven, Steven has, has tweeted something already about this image. He has quote tweeted this image um, and is, is is saying mean, disparaging things uh, about about GP. Uh, you I, know, no, all I said was it's okay. I'll Gary just, Patterson I'll, won't see it because Steven's blocked. I, he just blocked <laughs> me. That's true. He blocked me. I, he, no, here's here's the funny thing. I don't know if I ever told you guys to update this story. So here's here's my funny. Here's the funniest part about this. So I was blocked by Gary Patterson, which is fine. Like. I get it. And then a friend of mine will like text me one day and, you know, we were laughing about it. And um, he was like, if you Venmo me $5, I will DM Gary. Cause Gary reads his direct messages. He's like, if you That's Venmo true. me $5, I'll DM Gary and I'll be like, Hey, you know, please unblock this guy. So I did, I Venmo him five bucks. And then my buddy, Chris, he DM Gary and he was like, Hey, you know, I know you're blocking a lot of people the other day. Steven's a great dude. You shouldn't unblock him. So then he unblocked me. He unblocked me. And then, 
like I tweeted something during the Kansas State game to the effect of like, okay, it's time he needs to go. And he blocked me again. So he's seen <laughs> he's seen my profile at least three times. Like he's looked at it physically. He blocked me, unblocked me, and then blocked me again. But anyway, all, I'm tw- all I tweeted was, did he get a honey butter chicken biscuit? Because apparently Chris Beard was giving those away at the game, the Texas students, because he's such a generous man. So, what, tonight? Yeah, tonight he was giving out. Well, I'd like to say that kids. that's 0-2 oh, that's oh for coaches giving away food tonight at games. I saw Porter Mosier very generously give out, give out pizza at the Oklahoma game tonight. So uh, mm-hmm. there is that going on as well. This Here's the thing, and, and this kind of hits something else, and I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask Jake and Linda can comment on, on, on this part of the conversation here. Like, we've barely hit on basketball. We, we you know, I was – We've been we've been discussing stuff right now, so that's why I missed the the Kansas State upset over Texas. But like football is really becoming twenty four seven. I mean, this is January eighteenth, and like I'm I'm only going to do a, a legit month of basketball coverage because football has pushed us as far back. I mean, this is a legitimate conversation about what Gary Patterson is going to do at Texas, Jake. Is it not? It is absolutely because uh, the whole conversation of. Is he an analyst or is he the defensive coordinator in waiting? Is he the coordinator who's behind the scenes pulling the strings? It's always ongoing. The thing about college basketball is it's being completely overshadowed by football, but it is what it is. <laughs> uh, Linda, like, if, so if Gary Patterson was like 20% less vindictive, would you be like, this guy should be our defensive coordinator? No, okay, I was pretty I was pretty anti Gary Patterson from the get go after Jim Knowles left. I'm still on my Joe Bob Clements train like there was a report that came out that he was going to Ohio State with Jim Knowles. And I was distraught for over a day before he came out and said that those rumors were false. But I just didn't like I, I'm not I don't want to give it to somebody that's been in the Big 12. I, I don't. I'm I'm ready to move into somebody new. You know, we do a lot of recycling and I, I recycling's great. You should recycle, but maybe not coaches. The NFL does it. And, and, uh, yeah. Mm, it, I don't know if that's the argument. <laughs> that you, well, here's you so here's make. this this is why it's like I know I know John's going through this right now, and I, Steven is, I guess, as well too. Like the Dan Quinn thing where it's like Dan. Dan and Gary are very similar to me where it's like GP should just be a defensive coordinator for the rest of his career. Because here's the thing that kid, or that, that, that kid, I don't know how much um, pitching to kids in their living room. Gary Patterson should be doing anymore. I don't know if that's his vibe. Dude, I don't know. Much imagine how much, imagine Mike Gundy and Gary Patterson walk into your living room. Right. Like, like oh, it's a whole lot of white guy here. There's a lot of white guy. It's just a like a of, live Fox News. A lot news of country. Like yeah, a lot room. of mullets. Yeah, just you know. Um, a lot. Well, but because you know, like for me, like Dan, Dan, you no, know, Dan Quinn had a really nice run at Falcons head coach for for a decent amount of time. So you know, it's I just think in the sense of like, hey, these guys can do an excellent job in this. We haven't seen GP yet, but we know we know he's a great defensive mind. So like, Gary is how old? Uh, Steven, 61, 62? Yeah, early 60s. So if he wanted to do like six more years of being a DC or a defensive coach or whatever it is, he could do it. Um, I thought Dan Quinn did an awesome job this year with the Cowboys defense. Uh, uh, John, do you agree? Is that is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, womp womp. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. going to be the Broncos head coach, isn't he? I would, I would say that the personnel wasn't as good as – the personnel was a bit propped up, uh, I, th- I thought, this year by by some schematics at some points and maybe vice versa at other points. Um. I thought he did a decent job. So like to me, you know, it's one of those things where, look, you get a bunch of assistants around him that are, uh, you know, that can help him with the recruiting side of things. Cause there are coordinators like Brent Venables who are awesome recruiters. And then there are some coordinators, uh, like I would say Bud Foster, maybe Virginia tech's a good example. Not always the guy you want to go old white mountain man. Not always the guy you want going into the room to pitch to kids, maybe in the Tidewater region, you know, that, 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 should, should be coming to school. It's just kind of how these things work out. So that I think that's a really reasonable rest of a career for him. Steven, the thing is, like, I guess why you'd be frustrated is that he could be a DC a lot of places. He could be a head coach in some places too, still. Yeah. 
he has decided to be an analyst of Texas. Is that really the crux of the issue here as opposed no. to being a DC elsewhere? Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, like if he, if he took, you know, the head coaching job at Virginia tech, whatever, you know, good for you or whatever school it might be. It's just mainly the in-conference rival thing. And I, I would like to see, I, I really don't know. I think I'm too close to really have a fully formed opinion about it. Um, in some ways, I think you'd be an excellent defensive coordinator, like just being a DC. I also know, I mean, like that TCU defense really, really struggled this year. And sure, it's different when you're a defense coordinator than when you're a head coach. And I think Dan Quinn's a perfect example of that. Um, but Gary also really seemed to struggle with one, like just getting plays called, you know, with like the speed of offenses and getting his guys lined up properly because he was so meticulous about wanting everybody in the right place. And he just didn't always have time to get things set up. Right. And then also he made his living for years with, and I know it's completely different personnel at Texas, but he made his living for years with smaller undersized players who had great speed. And for a long, long time, you know, even early in his big 12 tenure, that was good because you're still facing a ton of spread offenses. And to a certain extent you still are now, but I think like, they lost some of the beef up front and as the league sort of shifted to a more physical style of play, they weren't ready. Like they got run over this year. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know. I I just, I'd be fascinated to see it happen. And analyst is the perfect thing for him because he can just kind of grind film, you know, pitch ideas. If he's willing to stay sort of in that box, then I think he'll be really good at it. But if he decides to, get outside of that, you know, like John was saying and get super involved with the defensive planning and want more power, then that's going to be a a problem, a dynamic problem for that staff. This has been a dynamic conversation. I feel like everybody's everybody. This has been, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, this is January 18th friends and we just went 45 minutes on football. Uh, It's, it's, it's been excellent. All right. Does anybody have any closing thoughts on this before I let everybody plug their various outlets? Anybody else make comment on, Cause here's the thing, Steven, like we've been doing this for a while now. And the fact that Gary Patterson is still providing us with a very valuable TCU corner segment makes all of us really uh, just very pleased. So I just, I want to say that it's January 18th and we're still getting at least like five to 10 minutes out of you and and being furious about GP. So that's that's good (laughs) stuff. All right. So I'll let you cool down before you plug your thing. So Jake, where can people find you and your work and all of its variety? Uh, all things BYU unlocked on Cougars, wherever you get your podcast, follow the show on social media, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter locked on Cougars. And if you want my thoughts on all things sports, follow me, Jacob C hatch on Twitter, John. Yeah. John nine Williams on Twitter, uh, locked on Sooners there and locked on Sooners podcast on the Facebook. Also subscribe to the show on YouTube free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Love the Facebook, uh, Linda. Uh, it's locked on pokes on all your podcast app and I am not very good at running the social page, but you can find all of my obnoxious <laughs> Oklahoma state and, and further sports opinions at Lindellians on Twitter. Self-awareness is a very valuable tool in this world. Uh, all right, Steven. Uh, I am at some Steven on Twitter. Gary can't see it, but you can at locked on TCU is the show account. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's where you can find me locked on horn frogs. It's a podcast wherever you get your pods. You guys can find me at Josh Neighbors underscore on Twitter. You guys can find the show on YouTube and wherever you guys get your podcast. Gang, this was fun. We'll see you next week and probably talk some basketball. Just kidding. There'll be some Caleb Williams news and Jackson Dart will be somewhere. Hopefully a Big 12 school. We'll have that next week. Love you guys. See you guys next time.